All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about cerebro ischemic strokes. So we already talked about the cervical wheels, but I want us to understand here is, first off, what is ischemia? How would you define ischemia? Ischemia is when there is a decreased oxygen supply to the tissues. But not only just an increased oxygen, uh, decreased oxygen supply to the tissues, but whenever they have the tissues have an increased oxygen demand. Okay, so ischemia is defined as having a decreased oxygen supply to the tissues, as well as the tissues having an increased oxygen demand. Whenever there is some type of ischemia of a lot of these different vessels that we're going to talk about, there can be detrimental effects on the body, and that's what I want to discuss in this video. Another thing that we're going to talk about at the end is there certain situations which are more common within certain vessels in the circle of Willis, maybe due to chronic hypertension or maybe due to connective tissue disorders, those vessels can balloon out and become extremely dilated. And the risk of that is it rupturing and leading to different types of like a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now what I wanna do is, is I wanna talk about clinical implications in this situation. Because it's good to know your, your anatomy and the blood flow to the brain, but it's even more important to understand what would happen if these vessels are affected. So we're just gonna hit a couple of them. We're not gonna hit every single vessel. We'll be here all day. We're gonna hit the most important ones. So first thing is let's say what happens. What happens if for some situation, the anterior cerebral artery is occluded. The blood flow to the area is occluded. There's some type of stroke, right, occurring there. So let's say first off, we do the first one, and we say that there is an occlusion, occlusion of anterior cerebral artery. If this happens, we're going to give the most basic, the, the most simplistic uh, clinical consideration to this. The anterior cerebral artery is going to come up, and it's going to supply the primary motor cortex, and it's going to apply, uh, supply the primary somatosensory cortex. So I want you to remember that if it does supply the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex, then what's going to happen? You're, not going to you're no longer going to have sensations. You're going to have loss of sensation on the contralateral side of the body. But here's where it's really particular. The anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial portion of those cortexes, the primary motor and the primary somatosensory. That is more specific to the legs, the lower limbs. So in this situation, an occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery could lead to, most commonly, contralateral loss of sensation and motor control to lower body. That is important. So if there's any effect in that artery, that is what can happen. Now, okay, now we talk about the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery, if this is affected, so let's say that there is an occlusion. So now let's say that there is an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. I want you to keep it very simple. Same thing, it's gonna apply, supply the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex. But specifically, it's gonna be going to the lateral side of those cortex. So if that's the case then, this is going to lead to contralateral, contralateral loss of sensation and motor control to upper, the upper part of the body. So for example, the face and the upper limbs. You know one other area that the middle cerebral artery supplies that's really, really important specifically on the left side of the brain? The Broca's area. So sometimes if this is affected, the middle cerebral artery, it can even damage Broca's area and lead to Broca's aphasia which is the inability to be able to produce speech. So Broca's aphasia. Okay, now let's come to the next point. The next point here is let's work our way down here. These are some of the common ones that I wanna hit. Uh, the next one is the posterior cerebral artery. Think about that one. Think about the most simplistic way. We actually talked about this, if you remember, in the optic nerve video. We talked about the visual pathway and lesions. If there is an occlusion of the posterior 
cerebral artery. Occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery. Do you know that this actually takes blood specifically to the occipital lobe and the occipital lobe is important for vision? If this is affected, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to have contra... So remember what we talked about there was the fibers going to the occipital lobe? And we said that they pick up uh, visual fields from the contralateral side and the ipsilateral side. Well, if this is affected, let's just say that it's affecting the, po uh, the actual right occipital lobe. Then the person will have, remember we said that they will have homonymous, hemianopia, right? So they'll actually lose temporal visual field and they'll lose the actual nasal visual field. So we talked about this a lot in the optic nerve video uh, when we talked about the visual pathway and lesions. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, we're going to get the basic concept here because I want, us to, I want this to make sense. Let's say that here we have uh, the left eye, right? So it's going to be the left eye. This is going to be the right eye. You know that this is going to have the optic nerve. This guy's going to have the optic nerve. And then here's going to be the optic chiasma. Right? And then this is going to come eventually to the thalamus. Okay, so here is our thalamus. Same thing over here. This is going to come to the thalamus. And then from here, you're going to have optic radiations. And these are going to be coming to a specific area of the brain, which we already know is going to be the occipital lobe here. Okay? So this right here is going to be the occipital lobe. Occipital lobe. Now, if you guys remember, we said that you have two visual fields. Let's say that here is your nasal hemiretiny, because here, let's say here's the nose. So this is the nasal hemiretiny. Same thing, this is the nasal hemiretiny. If we do this in green, this is the temporal hemiretiny and temporal hemiretiny. If you guys remember, we said that you have your left visual field over here, and it's separated into two parts, a temporal and a nasal. Same thing over here, you have a nasal and a temporal. And if you guys remember, the nasal hemiretiny picks up images in the temporal visual field, and the actual temporal hemiretiny picks up visual information from the nasal visual field. And then we said that these fibers here, the nasal hemiretiny, let's say that we damaged the right occipital lobe. These nasal hemiretiny fibers are going to come over and they're going to cross. They're going to go to the contralateral side and then they're going to go to the occipital lobe, the right occipital lobe. Whereas the fibers here, which is picking up the nasal visual field, they are going to be going and staying ipsilateral and then going to the right occipital lobe. If you damage the occipital lobe because of a posterior cerebral artery occlusion, you're going to lose what visual field? If you have here the person's eyes now, you're going to lose which one? You're going to lose this visual field. This one's going to be gone, okay, on the left eye. And then I come over here, I'm also going to lose the nasal visual field. So that's what I was trying to explain here with losing the temporal visual field and losing the nasal visual field. Okay? That covers that. Now let's go to this guy over here. This one is really, really sad um, if it can happen to people. Um, it's, it's an occlusion of the basilar artery. If there's an occlusion of the basilar artery, it's a very dangerous situation. This can produce what's called locked-in syndrome. So occlusion of the basilar artery can produce what's called locked in syndrome. Okay? Now locked in syndrome is, is really, really devastating. And the reason why is the basilar artery, there's your corticospinal tracts, which are kind of running through the pons, 
And whenever the bacillar artery is damaged, the perforating branches that are going to the pons is occluded and it damages the corticospinal tracts on both sides. So if there is bilateral damage to the corticospinal tracts, this results in quadriplegia, right? So again, in Lockton syndrome, it results in a uh, bilateral loss of corticospinal tracts. In other words, the patient, patient is completely paralyzed. But here's the worst thing. It, it, they somehow preserve the vertical eye movements. So the person still has the ability to have what's called vertical eye movements. And the person is still alert and conscious and aware of what's going on. That is what's so sad is that the person is completely alert, they're completely conscious, they can move their eyes, they can blink, but they can't move and it's such an unfortunate situation and a result of the occlusion of the bacillary artery. Okay, so that's that one. The next one is we're gonna go down here, let's say that there is the occlusion of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Let's do this one here. Um, occlusion of anterior inferior cerebellar artery. This right here, occlusion of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery usually results in what's called lateral pontine syndrome. Lateral pontine syndrome. Now, lateral pontine syndrome, when you talk about the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, one of the big things is, is it's commonly going to affect one of the specific cranial nerves, cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. So if you have cranial nerve seven palsy, what do you think could happen to this person? They might have paralysis of the facial muscles. So that's an unfortunate thing. Another situation is it can damage the vestibular nuclei in this area too. So if it damages the vestibular nuclei, it can cause a vertigo and maybe even with nystagmus. And another thing is, depending upon the severity, it can even uh, affect the actual labyrinthine arteries, and this can even le possibly lead to deafness, and maybe to a lesser degree, some tinnitus, some ringing in the ears, okay? Another thing is, is it affects the actual cerebellar peduncles. Uh, specifically, since we're at the pons, it would affect the middle cerebellar peduncles. If that's the case, it can cause certain cerebellar symptoms like ataxia, right? So it could produce uh, loss of, uh, or let's say poor, poor coordination, coordination, and tone of your muscles, and maybe even uh, balance. Now, these things right here that I'm mentioning is primarily all ipsilateral in nature. So what I mean here, it's, these are going to be usually produced on the same side of the body. So this usually is going to be presented in an ipsilateral fashion, okay? But because another tract runs up through there, the spinothalamic tract, because the spinothalamic tract runs up through there and there's damage to the spinothalamic tract, there could be Con, um, contralateral, contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensations from the body. So it's an unfortunate thing there, right? So if there's the occlusion of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, that is one damaging thing there is it can produce contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensations because it damages the spinothalamic tract. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one that could be affected is this guy right here, anterior spinal artery. You know the anterior spinal artery? Let's actually do this one right here. The anterior spinal artery is, this is really bad. This is a really, really bad one. The anterior spinal artery 
if there is an occlusion of the anterior spinal artery, so occlusion of the anterior spinal artery, this produces what's called medial medullary syndrome. So it's called medial medullary syndrome. Now medial medullary syndrome, if you think about it, this is right around the actual uh, the medulla. So because it's affecting the medulla, it's going to affect a really, really important area here. One is, you know, there's a cranial nerve that actually runs through there. It's actually called the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve. So because of that, someone with medial medullary syndrome, it can affect the actual hypoglossal nerve. So it would produce ipsilateral cranial nerve 12 palsy which obviously could affect the tongue movements and swallowing and dysarthria affecting the pronunciation of words and speech and articulation. Another thing is, you know right here, we're going to have the corticospinal tracts. So the corticospinal tracts could be affected. So it could actually produce what? It could actually cause an effect on the actual uh, contralateral hemi Plagia. And this could result basically in either paralysis or loss of motor control to the contralateral side of the body. And the last one is, you know the medial lemniscus runs up where that is too? So if there's damage to the medial lemniscus which carries touch, pain, temperature, proprioception, there could be contralateral loss of touch pressure, and vibrations. But one more important thing, really, really important thing, proprioception would be affected. And this is super, super bad, okay? So one of the things that you can see in people with medial medullary syndrome, which is an occlusion of the anterior spinal artery, is ipsilateral 12th nerve palsy, contralateral hemiplegia, which is basically going to be loss of motor control on the opposite side of the body, and contralateral loss of touch, pressure, vibrations, and proprioception. Okay, we come to the last and final one. This guy right here, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, what if there's an occlusion of this sucker right here? So if there's an occlusion, an occlusion of posterior inferior cerebellar artery. If there is an occlusion of this bad boy, what could happen? Okay. Well, first off, it's going to go to the cerebellum. So if there's damage to this, it's going to alter the blood flow to the cerebellum. This can produce certain types of cerebellar signs. What are some of these cerebellar signs that you might see in this patient? Again, same thing like this. You might see poor coordination, uh, muscle tone, and altered balance. Even their balance or equilibrium might be thrown off. Okay, what else? Okay, well there's another cranial nerve that actually runs from out of the medulla here, right out of this area right here. It's actually perfectly placed. It's the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. Perfect. That guy right there, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve supplies so many different structures. But if he is damaged, if he is damaged, one of the things that you're going to see with this uh, guy is this is going to produce one of the classical signs is dysphagia. So trouble swallowing. And they might even have a negative gag reflex. They might even have a negative gag reflex. So that's one thing. And their uvula might be actually deviated too. But again, 10th cranial nerve palsy can usually result in dysphagia and maybe even a negative gag reflex. Another really important sign here, if there's the occlusion of this vessel, there's sympathetic fibers that actually descend down here. And if those fibers are damaged, these fibers are actually going to come out and then go up to a specific point, specifically like the actual eye. And if that is affected, these descending sympathetic fibers, it can produce what's called Horner's syndrome. And Horner's syndrome is usually damaged to the sympathetic fibers that are going 
to the actual eye. And as a result, this can produce symptoms such as uh, pupil constriction because there's inhibition of the sympathetic fibers. And you know the sympathetic fibers cause pupillary dilation. Well, unopposed, it's going to lead to pupil constriction or meiosis. Okay, the next thing is that actually there's no sweating. Because you know the sympathetic nervous system actually innervates the uh, sweat glands? And it's weird because those, gl those nerves that are going to the sweat glands are actually cholinergic. So they release it onto muscarinic receptors which produce sweat. Well, the damage in this would no longer produce sweat. So this is going to cause an hydrosis. Another thing is, it's going to cause the upper eyelid to droop. And if the upper eyelid droops, this will cause ptosis of upper eyelid. Now, one more thing that I want to mention here, and I'm just going to mention, I'm not going to write it down, but I want you to, to think logically and to try to visualize this. There's two tracks that are going to be running wherever the posterior inferior cerebellar artery go. Okay. One is called uh, the spinothalamic tract. Now, if you remember, the spinothalamic tract is going to be carrying what? Pain and temperature sensations. But if there is damage to the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, what do you think is going to happen? There is going to be contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensations from the actual contralateral side of the body. That's one thing. Another thing that can happen is there's another tract that actually runs up through here to the spinal nucleus. You know, there's the nucleus, the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve system. That's going to be carrying pain and temperature from the face. But if the posterior inferior cerebral artery is occluded, guess what's going to happen? They're going to have ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensations on the side of the face, right? That same side. So I want you to remember that. Okay. Last thing that I want to hit here, last thing that I want to hit here is going to be aneurysms. Now, aneurysms, there is of different types. The ones that occur in the circle of Willis are usually in the form of what's called Barry aneurysms, or there's another name. So there's actually what's called Barry aneurysms, or we call them saccular aneurysms. So these are usually a result of two different situations. Two main causes of Barry aneurysms or saccular aneurysms is of two common causes. One is chronic hypertension. So that's one reason. One reason is chronic hypertension. Someone who has hypertension, it puts a lot of force on the blood vessel walls, it causes them to become fibrotic, it actually damages the actual elastic lamina, and eventually over time they can start ballooning out. Another case, which is obviously not as common, is connective tissue disorders. So if someone has some type of connective tissue disorder, for example, Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it can alter the normal actual histology of those blood vessels. And again, if they don't have that elastic fibers or the collagen fibers, they're not going to be as resilient or elastic. So whenever the pressure is pushed through these vessels, it's going to cause them to balloon out. Now the damage of that is if these aneurysms rupture. It can be very, very serious. It can cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? Now, the most common areas of berry or saccular aneurysms is this sucker right there, the anterior communicating artery. This is the most common site of Barry aneurysms. Out of all of them, he accounts for around 40%. Uh, so if we were to say here, the anterior communicating, communicating artery, this guy is going to account for approximately 40% of the Barry aneurysms that occur within the central nervous system, right? Or the circle of Willis in this case. The other one is going to be the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery, and we already talked about uh, the occlusion of those vessels, but what happens if there's an aneurysm and it ruptures? This is around the area of approximately 34%. So if there's an aneurysm that develops within the middle cerebral artery, so if there's an aneurysm here in the anterior uh, communicating, or an aneurysm out here within the middle cerebral. There's another one too which can happen in the internal carotid artery. 
Not as common, but that can actually cause an aneurysm here, and that's around 20%. So approximately 20% for an internal carotid artery aneurysm. And another one, again, not as common. You know we have the basilar artery here, and it branches into the posterior cerebral arteries. Here at that point there where it bifurcates into the posterior cerebral, this P1 segment, right there in the middle, that is the most common site for the barrier aneurysms also in this situation, but that only accounts for about 4% of the barrier aneurysms in the circular Willis. All right, engineers, so in this video, we covered the ischemic stroke of the cerebral blood supply. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy it, and I hope you guys learned something from it. So if you guys did, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe, guys. Also, if you guys get a chance, go check out our Facebook, our Instagram, maybe even our Patreon account. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.